just got back from family vacation, which was great um, and hard and wonderful and messy, and I didn't expect it to be. I really didn't. I just assumed that a group of good people who are all kind of wanting to live well and love one another and share in a joyful week, I just thought that would kind of cover it. Be enough. <laughs> I thought it would be enough. <laughs> and I, I'm really sort of surprised at my naivete at this point, but, but shocked in the midst of it. Like, so we're not going to name names in this podcast so we can tell some stories. But there are some of us in our family system who love to get places on time. <laughs> and so when it's, hey, you know, we're going rafting today, that's the activity. And, and so everybody, you know, we're leaving at 10 and that kind of thing. And then 10 o'clock rolls around and that half of the, of the family system is ready to go, sunblock on, you know. And the other half are like making coffee and and like literally haven't had breakfast yet. And and they think that's okay. The point is like there is kind of this incomprehension to that's actually not okay. You are now stalling the whole momentum of things, right? Oh, wait, I got to go back and clean my sunglasses. And you go, actually, you don't. Anyway. Point being this, I came away from the family vacation with a kind of refreshed perspective that everyone has a way. We all have a way, a way of doing life. And our way is profoundly affecting the people we love and the people in our world. And our way is worth looking at. Friends, welcome back to the Ransom Tart Podcast. Uh, chuckling in the background here is Morgan and Alan with me, John, in the studio this week and next to just um, want to kind of unpack something that we haven't spent a lot of time on before, and that's the idea of everyone has a way, a way of approaching life, a, a way of handling everything from neat to messy, spending to saving, on time to not on time. It just We have a way. We have a way of doing life. And I think it's important that, that we have a look at it. Yeah, I could totally relate to your story. And I think I'm, I'm the guy making coffee probably where everybody else is waiting at the car. So when you're telling that- Laying was, on the horn. I'm like, I'm like <laughs> and Just, what's, what's like the problem? That's like the process up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very real. And John, when you brought up this topic, like I see it in our family. And until it's named, it just feels like this kind of low-level aggravation of why aren't people doing it the right way, which of course is <laughs> our way, which isn't really right or wrong sometimes. But uh, as oh, you— Oh, wait a second. Yes. <laughs> wait, uh, yes, it is. That's the whole point I'm trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's it's such thin ice because even as you name the categories, we realize whatever our way is, we are quick to justify it, to sanctify it, yes. rather than to, as I hear you saying, John, look at it, right? Just pause and just name. We do have a way. Well, okay. So this is all what I want to look into. But let me pause and say, gang, here's why this is really valuable. Because through the week, a lot of warfare got in and a lot of joy got stolen, mm -hmm. frankly. And the thief comes, right? And he, he's looking for an opportunity. He's looking for, an, you know, a crack in the system. And I think it, you'll be refreshed and relieved and surprised, frankly, at what we want to blame on warfare or mm -hmm. what, what we want to blame on other people's issues. This very basic thing of the collision of our ways. Yes. And the collision of our ways, I think, actually is is one of the primary open doors for the enemy to get in and hurt relationship and misinterpret things and steal joy. And I mean, my goodness, has this been true in our marriage over the years? When two people get married, those two people are very, very different. Opposites do attract. And you have a way. And your way is so natural to you 
and so completely justified yes. that you don't really consider it as one of the variables that actually might be letting in some thievery or tension or accusation or eroding relationships. So I think the potential in this conversation for a lot of relief and redemption, I think, is very high. So that's why I wanted to bring Mm -hmm. it up, right? So we all have a way. And gang, those of you who have tracked with Ransom Heart for a while, I do want to clarify, over the years, we've talked a lot about style of relating. And, you know, you're a move toward or you're a move against, right? Your different styles, you you hide or you dominate or, you know, all the different ways we've expressed style of relating. And that's not what we're talking about today. That's a piece of it. But this is actually much bigger and much more comprehensive than that. And it touches upon kind of our whole general approach to life. There's just a a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death, the scripture says. There is a way that seems right to a man. It seems so right to us. It's so normal to us. So a couple more stories to get us going here. So I had an uncle, unnamed, who was a talker. Oh my gosh, his, which was a gifting that I don't have in relationship. He was a talker. He was a chatter. His ability to fill hours just talking. And he was in from out of town. And so, of course, I want to take him to dinner. But the problem was I had a publishing dinner that night. And I had, you know, Alan, you remember this world. Like, you know, those are important dinners. Right. And the publishers and, you know, everybody's flown in and it's a big deal. And you're going to, you know, publishing dinner. And so, but I invited a no-named uncle to come because he was only there for that evening. I thought he'd get a kick out of it. Okay. So here's how the evening goes. We sit down at the table. We do introductions. Hi, you know, Sally, Bob, this is my uncle. Uncle, this is Sally and Bob. Oh, nice to meet you kind of thing. Where are you from? I swear to you, from that one question. So where are you from? He literally spoke for an hour. For the meal. Oh, my gosh. He dominated the entire (laughs) evening. And I I was shocked at his inability to recognize... When to stop talking. Like, he literally talked for an hour straight. We went through the entire meal, and we went through dessert, and he was still talking about himself. He literally took away an evening. He took it away in a couple ways. He took it away in the chance of, I didn't get to, you know, sort of spend time with him. Mm -hmm. But he also took away this, what could have been this really rich, fun, enjoyable evening with four Mm -hmm. people at dinner, not just one, right? That is a way. It's a way he had, and it would happen in any situation you put him in, you know, at the auto parts store or after church in the hallway. I mean, wherever he is, like, he would just do that, Mm -hmm. right? You know Mm -hmm. what I'm talking about? People in their way. John, what comes to mind for me, this great quote of a good friend that often says, the problem with vacation is I go with me. (laughs) I think that a vacation will just get me away from the things that I'm contending with, but I take with me my way. And so as you tell that story, I don't think your uncle talking was unique to you. It wasn't that he wanted to share things with you, right? It's the way in which he does life in any circumstances. And so what's easy to see is other people's way because it's different than ours. Yeah. But... What's so important in this dialogue is to get to what is my way? Yeah. Why is it my way? And as you're saying, what is its impact and what do I want to do about that? Yeah. It's bigger than loving. It involves loving, Mm -hmm. but it's bigger than that. We used to take this guy with us on camping trips and he was a very loving guy. We invited him. Multiple times because we really enjoyed his coming. He's a good guy. This isn't like bad person, good person. This is a good guy. But he was a futzer. Oh, my gosh. His ability to futz and putz and dink around like with all his gear. And he would be like arranging things and stuff. And people are like, ready to go. Like, like let, you know, let's go for a hike. Or, hey, you know, it's time to grill. or what. And he would be like futzing. And it was just his 
way. Now, it wasn't malign. It wasn't evil, right? It wasn't intentional sabotage. There was not a streak of meanness to it. Yeah. I don't even think there was a streak of selfishness to it. Mm. I think it was innocent mm. incomprehension. But what you're saying is it had a dramatic impact on you, right? right? It creates a culture right? of camp. Right. And if you're doing a multi-day trip, I mean, there are implications. Mm. I'm curious for you guys, can you think of an example of where your way was exposed where circumstances put you in a place where you got to observe, oh, this is my way, that something normally you don't have much visibility to. I'll go back to the family vacation thing because I need to own my major part in that. Like, so one of my ways is I, it's see, even as I begin to talk about this, I'm going to couch this in a way that sounds totally justifiable. <laughs> it's really amazing. It's great. Okay. So one of my ways is I hold all plans very loosely. And we'll explain more in part two on this of how this all gets shaped. But it was something that's been shaped over time, mm -hmm. shaped in my childhood. But I hold all plans very loosely. And so it was the rafting day and everything I described in the introduction was taking place. You know, people are cleaning their sunglasses. People are having breakfast. People are making coffee. Literally at the moment we're supposed to leave. And so as camp director, you know, I'm a little frustrated with that. But I'm also very flexible with plans. So I turn to my wife and here's where I blow it big time. I say, well, we could actually go Thursday. We don't need to rush this. There's options. Like if people want to just hang out and just kind of flow with the morning, I don't, I don't need to push this along. We could, well, here's what I forgot. Stacy is exactly the opposite. She does not like having things that she's been looking forward to changed at the last minute. Mm. And I should have, I mean, come on, we've been married 35 years. Like, but I've done this to her through our entire marriage where I'll just throw a new idea on the table at the last minute, and it really throws her. It's not kind at all. She's ready. She's looking forward to it. This is what today was about, you know. She had a lot of hopes around it. And in my way, that to me seems like flexibility, hey, I'm mm. just being flexible, right? I'm ready to throw the whole thing under the bus wow. and go, we can scrap today and, and go another day. And that's not good on yeah. her heart, Right. John, what's so important is your awareness of your way, right? That's what we want to get to is you could easily stay at the place of, hey, I'm flexible. I'm willing to let it go. There's people that are futzing. And, but what you just articulated is so important to say, though that motivation would have been genuinely good. You know, I'm willing and to be flexible. And maybe even helpful. And Right. And maybe even look like love yeah. to the larger group. The implication is it has an impact on your wife yep. in a long-standing yes. way of relating. Yeah. So I think that it's really important as you're saying that it causes me to simply go, how aware am I mm -hmm. of my way and its impact? And is that what I want? Yeah. And where Kelly and I see that as being very unique in our ways is any gathering we go to, whether it's a church or another couple or a larger group, there's one way, which is my way, which has been, let's go, but we'll leave pretty quick. And when we leave, we'll just kind of slide out. If it's not just another couple, if it's a group, we'll just kind of talk a little and then fade out and go. Well, Kelly's way, which is stay and talk and soak it all up and and without realizing really about the time, you you soon see you're one of the last people there because as long as there's people to talk to, she wants to pour into those people. And it's a beautiful thing. But, but unbelievably aggravating to you. Well, <laughs> <laughs> depends if she's Let's listening be, or not. <laughs> Let's be honest. We'll do marriage counseling it's, after it's this. It's the yeah. collision of ways. And it's yeah. exactly opposite in this case. And it comes into play about once a week. And as we talk about ways, like what doesn't work is, okay, I'll do it your way this time. You do it my way next time because you forget whose time it is. And what's been interesting in this last year or so has been 
us trying to really value and understand each other's way rather than, here we are 20 years in our marriage, rather than keep expecting the other to either be somebody they're not or to somehow see their way as inferior. Yes. And that they that's need what, to fix. That's what I've been waiting for. <laughs> Has it worked? <laughs> no. Eventually. But I've been, waiting, I've been waiting for the world to realize <laughs> That my way is the right way. Oh, how's that working for and you, the, John? And the people will just get in line with it. <laughs> See, it's right, relief. Let's be right? Doesn't honest. that sound great? Let's be honest. I'm embarrassed because so many stories are coming up. Like, it's just funny. It's like, okay, how deep do you want to go? But it's one example. So Sherry and I signed up last week to volunteer for Back to School Day, our daughter moving to middle school. It's a boot camp day where it's orientation day, it's field exercises, Mm -hmm. activities, and it's a brilliant strategy to get into your child's world in seventh grade. You get a read spiritually on who's there because four schools are combining, and you meet the kids, you meet the teachers. As an idea, it's great. So we show up, and I'm very tired from a big mission that I just came off of. So I'm vulnerable. In other words, more interested in my way to feel good, right? Mm. I want to do my way. And in my way and in that type of environment, I generally like to pull back. I generally like to not be in the spotlight and Mm. not be gregarious and not be the cheerleader with pom-poms and a miniskirt. I can do that. But my choice would be, hey, just kind of let other people be the loud voices, and I'll just encourage on the side. But what I was asked to do was be right in the center and organize field games and rally kids and get their attention and cheerlead and tell stories. And I could feel in my flesh, I don't want to do this. Now add to it, my wife and I are assigned to be partners And we have very different ways because part of it is a character formation. It leads to, how'd that go, kids? What did you do in the activity? What surfaced? How can this apply to your school year in group work? (laughs) So Sherry is the processor, the encourager, and I can throw in the cheerleading, you know, pom-poms, miniskirt. The point being is I was asked to step out of my way. And that was love, and it was very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It required crucifying the self-life of where I feel safe, where I feel love, where I feel at peace, and even more so crucifying what I actually think is good in that environment to bring the group together that's different than what my wife thinks is good and Mm -hmm. important, Mm -hmm. and we had to find a way. And so it was fascinating. We had three rotations, and every rotation we got a little better and by the end, we finally kind of found a what I would call a, a holier way to love the kids, love ourselves, and love each other. But I share that story to say it's very revealing when we're put in a circumstance that requires us to be different than our way and how quickly we're exposed our false place of security mm-hmm. in so many circumstances. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Security or love or safety or... A reach for connection. A reach for life. Yeah. Have you noticed also, it isn't just individuals form a way over time, a way that feels totally natural to us, completely justified. And why don't other people live like we do? You know, our way just feels so right. Mm -hmm. But have you noticed also that marriages have a way as a unit? Households have a way. You know, you'll go into... You go into one home, and it's the messy home, and they're just comfortable with a lot of chaos, and there's just stuff everywhere, toys or food from last night still on the counter, right? It's just, and they're very comfortable with that. Like they can, that family system can live with a lot of chaos, you know, and you go into another, and it's like, no, no. I mean, like, there's a guy whose yard I drive by. I mean, this guy has every stick in its place. I mean, his car is always washed and parked in the same place. His yard is immaculate. There literally isn't anything out of order in his world. So that would be another way, mm-hmm, right? Like, right. And, it's, and you, you go into it, and it, it is a family system. It, families have a way yes. as well. Have you noticed that? Oh, totally. And where we notice it a lot is our kids are at the age of sleepovers and hanging out with friends and They'll come home and they'll say, 
wow, like they have this big spread for breakfast and we just do it here this way and they stay up a certain, you know, really late or they don't do this or – and it's interesting because you start to think your family rhythm is the right way, the, right, the normal way. And and I know a lot of kids – Kelly and I were talking about the other day that their parents don't let them do sleepovers. And one reason is because they're not comfortable with people doing things differently. Well, our kids always go to bed at this time or we don't allow phones here. We do allow this or – and so one way that we've seen that's been really beautiful for our kids to kind of get a taste of the world is, yeah, if we trust the family and we know them – Go experience something different. Come home and tell us what that's like rather than pull inward and kind of protect your way because you do omelets every Saturday Mm -hmm. morning and you don't do this and you go here. And so it's been an expansive way through our kids for us to see how other people live and a really beautiful way that kind of opens our horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay. This makes me think of an essay. Okay. (laughs) It's really funny. I just – my levels of confession – are expanding rapidly through this conversation. <laughs> G.K. Chesterton has this beautiful essay, and I'll, I'll have to try and remember what the name of it is later, but it's something just like on the family. Mm-hmm. It's not a book. It's just an essay. And he's talking about the difference between clubs and families. And he said the problem with clubs is it's something that you voluntarily join, and you join it because all of the other people in that club do life the way you do. Right? That's why you're drawn to them. It is an association of like weighed people, Mm. right? And so, you know, you you like a quiet room and so you join that club, or you like the crazy and wild, so you join that club, or that sort of thing. But he says the problem with the family is is that you are put by God, and he Mm. really sees a divine conspiracy in Mm -hmm. it. You are put by God into an extended family system. And he would include aunts, uncles, grandparents, like an extended family system. And he says, your aunt is a bolt from the blue. (laughs) You know, like these things come at you out of nowhere in order to shape you. Mm. And clubs don't shape you because your way is completely affirmed there, or at least untouched and unchallenged. But in closer relational systems, and I would add to that, Within church systems, you know, within small groups, Mm -hmm. it isn't necessarily just within a family. Churches have a way. You know, you go into certain churches and you can kind of experience, Mm -hmm. oh, this is a really chatty group. And they love the chatty thing. Or like, oh, whoa, no, this is a very on-time group over here. And they they love the schedule and they stick to it (laughs) down to the millisecond. So churches can have a way— Small groups can have a way, right? Yes. And I'm thinking what what we're just trying to introduce here is that our way permeates our entire life. And it's something that we consider to be so reasonable and right and justified because of all the things that have shaped it. And we do think things have shaped it, and more on that in a moment. But just to give some Questions for thought, like, how do you feel? What is your way towards being on time or not being on time? What is your posture towards commitments in general? Are commitments something that are really solid and said and done? Or are commitments something that are kind of more open uh, and loose? What is your way towards order and clutter? You know, messy versus neat. What's your way towards that? What's your feelings towards that? What's your posture towards it? What is your way with money? Are you free to spend money on things? Are you afraid to spend money on things? Like, what is, you have a way. And just to show these categories I'm naming, like, it's pretty all encompassing. It approaches your pace of life. Mm-hmm. And what you consider to be a reasonable pace, and it approaches your lifestyle in terms of buying and spending and gathering and giving and that sort of thing. Do you see how you see how comprehensive? Oh, it is. It is. As you're even naming those categories, you see how how deep it goes and how broad-reaching it is. And and John, where I go with it is, 
it makes the work of Christ so hopeful mm. because it's so extensive. And, we, you know, often at Ransom Heart, we talk about mm. the gospel is far more than salvation. It's restoration. But as you're saying that, what we mean by restoration is Jesus can actually heal us and mature us in a way that we do live above and beyond our way, not mm. to mute our personality. No, no. Right? right? No, no. But I think like an example, you know, you look at Jesus and ask the question, what is he like? In other words, what was his way? And and it's a fascinating question. It's worth consideration to look and observe and, and let God speak to you through his life. But one thing that comes to mind is he was deeply unpredictable. In other words, his way isn't fully consistent in different circumstances, yeah, right? He good. lives out of a union with his father yeah. and a wholeheartedness where he's not primarily looking for safety in circumstances and for a false attachment, but he's bringing life. And that's where I, I just think it's so hopeful to wonder what is the work of the kingdom Morgan, I'm going to catch you right there and just let everybody sit with this because it's inviting and it's disruptive. It's hopeful. And I can even feel some threat in it. There's no threat. There's no threat, dear ones. To step towards looking at your way is really beautiful and hopeful. And the protector of joy and the protector of relationship is, as we're more conscious of it. So I think we're going to pause and just let let everyone linger and think about this and then pick it up next time with, so where do we go mm -hmm. with it? You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge, Morgan Snyder, Alan Arnold here in part one of a two-part series on our way. <laughs>